presentation is entitled Dispersion of a Solute in Casson Fluid Flow Under the Influence of External Body Acceleration. So it sounds like it's a fairly technical presentation. Look forward to hearing this one, uh, Ajani. Thank you very much, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. The topic of my talk is the dispersion of a solid in Casson fluid flow subjected to external body acceleration and the effect of wall absorption. And this work was done under the supervision of Dr. Nagarani Ponakala. So we have an introduction here. So the basic principle underlying dispersion theory is a spreading of a passive species, otherwise called a solute in a flowing fluid due to the combined action of molecular diffusion and non-uniform velocity distribution. Dispersion theory has many applications in different fields. In chemical engineering, for example, dispersion theory plays a pivotal role in chromatographic separations. And in environmental science, we can think of the transport of contaminants and or pollutants in the air. In physiological systems, an area in which our work finds consummate applicability, we can contemplate the transport of nutrients in the bloodstream. Normal human blood flow, circul normal human blood circulates as a consequence of the pumping action of the heart, which in turn produces a pressure gradient throughout the circulatory system. The literature is bountiful in demonstrating that Cassin fluid satisfactorily predicts the flow behavior of blood. The human body is routinely subjected to acceleratory and or vibratory motions. Let's say when we're driving, or operate, driving a vehicle, or operating machines, exercising, etc., and the body naturally adapts. However, with these sudden and sometimes dramatic and sustained velocity changes, physiolog physiological effects may result. So the aforementioned is a sufficient motivation for this model, which seeks to better understand the spreading of a solid in blood flow based on a Cassin model in an artery with absorption at the artery wall when subjected to both pulsatile pressure gradient due to the usual heart action and periodic body acceleration. So our methodology is such that we consider an axially symmetric laminar set in fully developed flow for viscous and compressive and non-Newtonian fluid. In this case, it's a Cassin fluid in the Z direction. And this is through a circular artery subjected to periodic body acceleration. And we have some assumptions that we take the artery wall to be rigid and sufficiently long so that entry and end effects are deemed negligible. We employ a cylindrical polar coordinate system and the flow is unidirectional. So the dimensionless Cassin's constitutive equation is given by equation number one. We also have here the dimensionless momentum equation as depicted by equation number two. And we set out, or we have solved equations one and two simultaneously to obtain the velocity distribution. And in particular, we have for the velocity distribution, equation numbers, equations number three and four, where W plus, W superscripted plus is the velocity in the shear region of flow and W superscripted minus is the velocity in the plug region of flow. So in terms of our mathematical formulation, we have the unsteady convective diffusion equation given by number five. And the solution to this equation number five, along with the initial and boundary conditions, has been formulated by Gillen Sankar Subramanian in 1970 and is given by equation number six. And where the mean concentration is defined by equation number seven. Employing Gill's approach and having carried out some mathematical maneuvers, we terminate with equations eight and nine. We, the KNs are what we call our transport coefficients and our FNs are depicting or representative of our concentration. So equations eight and nine are a coupled pair of equations which we will attempt to solve. So from equations eight and nine, we employ a finite difference scheme and using n equals zero, one and two, we have equations 10, 11 and 12 respectively. We also have obtained an expression for the mean concentration in terms of the, th the three aforementioned coefficients. And see, so we see there that is represented by equation number 13. 
We've also used the crank nickels to find a different scheme to solve the governing equations. And for the purposes of this study, and that it's attendant phys possible physiological applications, we use these real life values. We allow alpha to vary, with alpha, which is the warmest the frequency parameter to vary from zero to 0 0.2. The fluctuating component of the pressure gradient E from zero to 0 0.3, the yield stress tau y between zero and 0 0.2 the body acceleration component B0 between 0 and 0 0.5, the exchange parameter at the, uh, the tube wall from between 0 0.001 and 1, and the initial slug length ZS is in the range 0 0.004 to 0.2. So based on our, our observation, we see that K0 does not depend on yield stress tau y, neither does it depend on the frequency parameters alpha or alpha beta, and alpha beta is actually the body frequency parameter, body acceleration frequency parameter, nor does it depend on the fluctuating pressure component E. However, the other two dispersion coefficients, K1 and K2, both depend on the aforementioned parameters as well as beta, B0, and time T. And for the case B0 equals zero, where there's an absence of body acceleration, and for variation in other parameters cited, this work has been compared to Sebastian and Nagarani in 2011 and has been found to be in qualitatively good agreement. So some results and discussion. Figure two, where we observe a variation of the negative convection coefficient K1 with the wall reaction parameter beta for different values of tau y and for the parameters below alpha, alpha beta, and E phi, which is phi, which is a phase angle or lead angle, and time and B naught, those are fixed for the variation with tau y. And we confirm here that the convection coefficient decreases with an increase in the yield stress tau y. In figure three, we have a variation of negative convection coefficient K1 with the wall reaction parameter, and this time for distinct values of the body acceleration parameter B naught. And we observe that as the body acceleration component increases, the magnitude of K1 decreases. And we put this down to the fact that oscillator and inertial forces may be dominating the flow. Equation four sees a time variation of the convection coefficient K1 when for different distinct values of the yield stress tau y. And we see an oscillatory, as we expect, an erratic nature of the flow in the presence of external body acceleration. This is clearly obvious from the graphic. Figure five, we see a time variation of dispersion coefficient K2 for distinct values of beta. And here we capture the variation of K2 for different values of the wall absorption parameter beta. We see that as beta moves from 0 0.001 to 0 0.1 about 100 times, the magnitude of change in K2, the dispersion coefficient, is significant. And as beta moves from 0 0.1 to 1, just 10 times, we see no qualitative change in the profile. However, quantitatively, the magnitude of K2 markedly decreases. Also, the general trend is that as B0 moves from zero, no body acceleration to 0.5, the presence of body acceleration, the magnitude of the dispersion coefficient K2 increases. However, with body acceleration present, we also observe the erratic nature of the flow. Graphic number six sees a time variation of dispersion coefficient K2. And here we observe that at some critical time, T approximately equal to 0 0.6, the flow is enhanced and attains a maximum dispersion rate when body acceleration is imposed. For the Newtonian case with no body acceleration as is depicted by the blue graph, the blue plot, the flow is predictably cyclic though unsteady. But in all instances, as, I, as can be seen from the graphic, when body acceleration is present, the fluctuation in the magnitude of the dispersion coefficient is much more pronounced. From graphic seven, here we have the axial distribution of the mean concentration, CM, for different values of the yield stress tau y, for fixed values of the other parameters involved in the flow. Here we see that as tau y increases from 0.02 to 0.05, the peak of the mean concentration also increases. Figure eight, Figure eight depicts the axial distribution of the con mean concentration CM for distinct values of the exchange parameter beta and for, the fixed, for fixed values of the other parameters involved in the flow. And figure eight captures this 
and it tells us unsurprisingly that the peak of the mean concentration is shortened in significant measure as the absorption coefficient increases in magnitude. Physically, this means that as there is less and less solid present in the system, this is so because absorption is taking place. So in concluding, we have observed that the magnitude of the convection coefficient K1 increases in tandem with the absorption parameter beta and decreases with yield stress as well as the body acceleration component. And we alluded the latter to the fact that oscillatory inertial forces may be dominating the flow. External body acceleration, we have also concluded, is kind of a contributory factor, a very contributory factor to the erratic nature of the flow, as is witnessed by marked fluctuations in the size of the convection coefficient. And also the dispersion coefficient is seen to be affected by the presence of external body acceleration, as is evidenced by dramatic fluctuations in its magnitude during the course of the flow. Here are a few references, and that terminates my presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions, I am here to entertain. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, presentation, uh, Ajani. All right. Um, we have one question here uh, from Richard. All right. So he's saying a uh, very uh, interesting work with clear applicability in other areas. All right. Uh, was the archery wall model as a rigid uh, prime primarily as means of gaining a basic physical understanding of the system and reducing model complexity initially? And if so, what effect would the more realistic condition of a flexible archery wall have on your prediction? I didn't get the first part of the question. Can you repeat for me, please? All right. Was the archery wall modeled as a rigid, primarily as means of gaining a basic physical understanding of the system? Oh, yes, um, that is yeah. so. That is basically, that, that was actually to make the model a little bit more mathematically, um, mathematically able to, 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 to solve, the, solve the equation that's going to be associated with the flow. Right. So and was, then the, the assumptions, model, those assumptions were taken, yes. Right. And uh, so what effect would the more realistic condition of a flexible archery wall have on your prediction? Well... We are actually in the process of we're, we're going to actually investigate that later on in some future research. Um, I suspect that this will, in some regard, make the model a little bit more complicated and may, we may find ourselves with some novel results here. Okay. Now, so um, I, I'm, very, to be I, I'm very... Sorry, I'm, I'm very interested in the, um, the, the simulation environment that you're using for, for these models. So what, what do you use? So we use, basically, we use MATLAB. Basically, we use a finite different scheme. So, okay. right. this, uh, is, this have, is theoretical. Have you used COMSOL at all? COMSOL, no, we have not. All right, uh, I see Graham has posted another question from Richard. Uh, has there been previous work in Casson fluid flow? Yes, there has been a lot of previous work in Casson fluid flow. Okay, and there's a couple blood, of that is, <laughs> Casson fluid as a model for blood is uh, is one of the most um, it's one of the most dominant models used in terms of modeling blood mathematically. Okay, good. Now, um, as as you you're trying to make um, uh, your models a little more realistic. I think uh, some of the presenters before in, in this se session, right? So for example, Manoj Kolam uh, with parallel processing, right? I think that may be another um, space that you can explore when you're doing your simulations because uh, if, you, if you're adding complexity to your model, right? Um, you know, the, the, the processing power uh, of your, your, your simulator would become very important. So I think that that's something that you could consider and you could make contact with Manoj and, and those guys doing the parallel processing as well. Thank you very much for that, Chair. That is very, very useful information that I have written down. Yes, good. All right, good. So thank